Um, so yeah, thank you for everyone who showed up. Um, and thank you for everyone who uh, sent through some um, solutions to last week's homework. I thought it might be a good um, a good idea to sort of, uh, you know, at least recap some of the concepts that we covered last week and uh, get re-familiarized with some of the equations because we're going to be expanding on these um, in an arbitrary number of, of dimensions. So we're going to be moving from bonding curves um, to bonding surfaces and then bonding volumes, bonding hypervolumes and, and so on. Um, so, <clears throat> why isn't that slightly changing? Here we go. Okay, so uh, one of the, the homework tasks that I asked you to think about um, was to basically uh, show that you can generalize um, some of these, you know, these equations into um, any number of, of steps um, by essentially piping together um, the same function over and over again. Um, so this is uh, for your recollection, um, delta Z is the number of liquidity pool tokens that are being issued. Um, and delta X is the, the amount of, um, of a, a certain cryptocurrency that you're providing to an existing, um, an existing reserve inside a liquidity pool. And we use the, the subscript P here to denote the pool, uh, T to denote the, the total amount of liquidity pool tokens that exist. Um, and delta X doesn't get a subscript because it affects both the user and the, the liquidity pool. So uh, I'm starting with this, um, create this equation. It's actually, it's not too difficult. And um, Curious Rabbit actually had, I think the, um, the best solution. Um, I've got a, a, a slightly worse one prepared or at least one that skips um, some of the steps at the back. Um, but uh, you know, if you guys um, ask Curious uh, nicely, I'm sure that he'll show you his, uh, um, what he, you know, his work. Um, so all I'm going to do here in order to, um, to, to make the, the solution a little bit more uh, intuitive is I'm going to be changing um, delta Z or generic delta Z um, for each one of the steps uh, to denote the, the specific token that it resulted from with its subscript. So this step, because we're actually adding um, the X token, whatever that is, um, I'm going to be denoting this delta Z with, um, with a subscript X. And what this means is the next token that we're going to add to the liquidity pool, um, let's call that token the Y token, um, the, uh, the total number of, of pool tokens that exist um, has now gone up by whatever this number is. And that's really the key to this solution, right? The, the rest of it is, is pretty trivial after that, albeit a bit tedious in some, in some cases. Um, so from here, um, the only thing you have to do then is basically substitute um, delta um, Z sub X uh, with the solution here to try and get rid of um, you know, this, um, you know, this nameless variable. And then from there, uh, we just recognize that the total number of, of liquidity pool tokens that are going to be issued is going to be the sum of these two expressions. Um, and so subbing uh, delta Z sub X and delta Z sub Y um, for, their, um, for their expressions and then expanding this out and simplifying will actually give you um, the, um, the result. So again, I'm skipping some tedious steps here, um, but there's actually a, a, a fairly fast method that, that Curious found that I thought was, that I thought was pretty good. Um, then the uh, another one of the uh, questions was to, instead of providing liquidity, let's have a look at the case where we're removing liquidity. Um, and it's basically exactly the, the same um, method. Um, so we start by um, re, um, re-denoting delta Z here, um, first with sub X, um, and then creating the next one, uh, sub Y, and uh, noting that uh, there is a change here um, for the... Um, Oh, this should actually be a, a negative. Oh. Uh, okay, so I, I have, uh, I, I apologize for that, that slide I just noticed has got a sign inversion, but that's okay. Um, the, the overall result should be basically the same, um, which is, yeah, you substitute these two expressions in um, and then expand and simplify and you will um, end up with this result, which is really nice. Okay, then. More importantly, um, is generating the swap equations. So remember what I said, which is that when um, when Bancor V1 was being developed, um, there was no sort of industry standard, right? It, it came before all of the um, the common nomenclature that we use to describe AMMs and bonding curves and everything else. And so the uh, you know whereas today the explicit focus when we're discussing bonding curves is on the reserve balances inside the pool. Um, 
the focus in the um, original um, the original documentation surrounding Bangkok was more on the uh, interaction between one of the reserves and the liquidity pool token, either that be the the price or its issuance or or, or whatever it happens to be. But what I said was that you can get exactly the same result just by piping these things together, right? So provide liquidity in one token to be issued a pool token, and then you know take all of those pool tokens and put them um, back in and redeem that liquidity for the token on the other side of the exchange. Um, so all you need is this expression, which is the um, the one that says, if you're adding Delta X tokens to the pool's XP reserve, then you receive Delta Z tokens in, in return. Um, and then the opposite, which is withdraw liquidity in a single token, which is you're burning Delta Z LP tokens from the total ZT that exist, and then uh, receive Delta Y tokens from the pool's YP reserve. Not too difficult. Um, so again, I'm going to um, take Delta Z and add uh, sub X just to make it clear what we're talking about. And then um, from here, we realize that after, um, after we've added liquidity on this side, the Delta Z sub X um, is going to be again added to the, um, the, the total here. So it's no longer just Z sub T, it becomes Z sub T plus um, Delta um, Z sub X. And because of the way that this formula is constructed in the in the generic way, notice that we just subtract that delta z sub x, um, you know, from itself anyway. Um, so this simplifies out very very quickly. Um, and then all we need to do is um, is take the um, <clears throat> is take the delta z sub x expression here, sub that in down here, and we get this expression. Um, and then after that. Again, just expand and simplify as much as possible. You should be able to get to this um, uh, this step relatively quickly. Um, and I would have actually accepted this as like a, a perfect, like this is still a perfect answer, um, but I find it just a, a little bit nicer to um, to multiply these exponents together um, to get to the you know the final result, the one that I um, that I show. Um, but again, I think that this is more of like a notational um, convenience. Uh, I have noted that some people prefer to keep this out here so that the radical is implicit rather than uh, is explicit rather than implicit, but whatever, to each their own. Now, once you've figured that one out, um, the, the, the thing that I asked you to, to think about, this wasn't necessarily a homework question, um, but something that we kind of ended the last lecture on and I think is a, a good place to cover it now, is that if we have this swap equation, um, can you show that the um, the invariant function that underpins the entire system um, is equal to um, to this expression? So for this, um, it's I think worthwhile to return to some of the conventions that we defined um, because you know while the uh, original literature for Bancor uh, uses things like, like absolute values, which makes some of the math, I think a little bit easier in some cases, um, here we're trying to subscribe to the, the, the industry conventions. And so what that means is that um, in general, we, uh, we try to force Delta Y and Delta X to always be a positive, um, a positive number. Um, and this is so that we don't end up with like underflow and other um, potential problems with um, with the smart contracts, including precision loss, because we need to store an extra bit to denote the sign. And so what, what you need to realize here is that because both of these are positive numbers, and by definition, delta y is being removed from the pool balance while delta x is always added to the pool balance, then at some time in the future T1, the amount of X tokens inside the liquidity pool is higher than what it started with. And at some point in the future, um, the number of Y tokens inside the pool is lower than what it started with. And so this just means that um, when we're calculating uh, Delta Y, it's important to take the amount that the pool started with and subtract the amount that it ended up with. Um, and for Delta X, we do the opposite. We take the um, amount that the pool ended up with and subtract the amount that it started with in order to get these two values. Uh, this isn't the only way to solve it, but I, I think it's the fastest once you've come to that realization, because here we can basically just uh, sub uh, delta y and delta x for these um, for these two expressions, which brings us to here. Um, and then after that, um, you can see that the x p t zero and x p t zero um, and negative uh, x p t zero negate each other, so you can basically get rid of that, which simplifies down to here. Um, and then after that. 
all we're going to out this yp at t0 um, and the um, uh, and the, the part in parentheses, um, which brings us to uh, this middle expression, which is just, you know, ypt0 minus something is equal to ypt0 minus something. So this means that ypt1 and whatever this is must be the same. And so we just um, set that equality. And then after that, it's just some, again, tedious uh, tedious steps moving the, the exponents around. Um, but if you can't see it, um, all I've done is divide through by ypt0 to get to this step. Um, I've um, raised uh, both sides to the power of ry, which means that we've got this fraction to the power of ry, and um, because of the um, because of the the way that exponents um, uh, operate, we've managed then to um, you know, to multiply out this ry and just get straight um, rx. Um, and then after that, I have moved the powers inside the um, the fraction to get to here. Um, and then the last step is is pretty easy. We basically just cross multiply um, in order to get these out. And what this shows you is that the that x in the pool at t0 raised to its um, reserve weight multiplied by the y token balance in the pool at time equals zero to its reserve weight is equal to essentially the same expression, but at the next time interval. And so this means that these, you know, it doesn't matter where you are in time. The uh, you know this result is always equal to this result, so you can just say that the um, the the pool balances um, of each token raised to their respective reserve weights is always going to be equal to some constant. Um, and if you wanted to go one step further um, and have a look at the you know the very narrow um, case where both of these um, you know where both of these um, reserve weights are exactly one half, then you can derive the you know the famous um, constant product formula, which was popularized later by um, by Uniswap and others. So that was the end of the homework. And I think, a, like I said, a really good um, refresher before we get into um, a slightly more um, complicated version of these same things. So recall um, that we started with, um, you know, with these formulas from the, um, the original Bancorp patent. And then I showed you how we can convert them using industry nomenclature um, into the, the modern convention. Now, because we're moving from two dimensions into you know, higher dimensions in this lecture, um, I'm going to play around with the, um, the syntax that we're using just to be able to accommodate you know, an, arbitrary, um, you know, uh, an arbitrary number of, of, of dimensions so that we don't like run out of letters or that we start you know, getting conflicts with different variables. So this is one of the... Um, you know, this is one of the, the, the swap equations that we, um, that we introduced. And all I'm going to do here is basically force um, all of the token balances that we're referring to, to always be the letter X um, sub some number, you, like some, some integer. So it's usually gonna be like a, a one or a two or a nine, depending on how many um, dimensions that we're using. Um, and so, you know, this looks, I guess, like a little bit weirder because there are x's all over the place now but if it helps just keep in the back of your mind that all we're doing is making it explicit that x is just a generic uh, a generic uh, variable name for a pool balance of some token and then we always subscript it with you know some number that denotes which to token we're talking about um so delta y becomes delta x j meaning the next you know the next token in um in you know in the line um, xp uh, or x sub p becomes x sub p sub i and y sub p becomes x sub p sub j. Um, I know that it's not, you know, there are at least a little bit of, of mental gymnastics here and I will try to, um, you know, I'll try to make sure that we keep it relatively slow. Um, and if you find yourself stalling, you know, when you're maybe revising some of these slides later or something like that, um, just come back to this slide to remind yourself how we do these substitutions. Um, but for the um, you know, for the other swap equation, which is you know to decide um, to decide how many uh, tokens you want to extract from the pool, and ask the question how many tokens do I need to provide um, to the pool in order to achieve that number? Again, we end up with the um, you know with, with the same uh, swap formula that you've seen before, but just substituting for this new um, this new subscript nomenclature. Um, I've tried to color code um, a lot of these formulas on the way through to try and keep it as um, consistent as I can. Um, but, you know, again, if, if you need me to, to stop and revise something, just let me know. Octopus. 
I want to be sure I haven't missed something important because sometimes notation hides important information. Sure. Um, is it accurate to say that primarily what you're doing here is going from an ordered pair to a vector, or is there something more sophisticated than that happening? Yeah, no, that's a totally reasonable way to say it. Um, okay, it, you, you could. Yeah, yeah, it, it's basically I'm going from a. Uh, it doesn't necessarily. It depends on what you mean by vector. Um, if you if if by vector you just mean a list um, of of stuff, then sure. Um, I would might prefer to think of it as a set. Um, but again, it, referring to the same idea. But yes, we're we're now referring to a liquidity pool that has arbitrary number an arbitrary number of different token identities, and they're all just kind of in there together. Um, and so uh, we're going to um, denominate them with whatever um, subscript we need in order to refer to the thing. Um, but in terms of the algebra, it's not going to matter too much. I just wanted to make sure that people understood why I'm using it this way, because eventually we're going to have to use the large operators and um, some of the uh, expressions that we're going to be looking at. It's just so much easier when you can, um, you know, when you can index uh, tokens, not by their name, but by their position in a list. Is that, is that clear, Octopus? Yes, very much so. Probably in tuple is better terminology than vector, but I, I think I understand what you're saying. Perfect. Okay. So yeah, um, if you remember this slide from the from the last lecture, uh, this used to be x and y, um, but now we're using x sub i and x sub j. Um, and again, I'm going to be using you know because we need. It, it, I think it helps just to decide that we're always going to be using um, J in a generic sense to refer to the token that is being extracted from the liquidity pool by the trader and the subscript I to be to denote the token that is being added into the liquidity pool by the trader, which also means um, that, you know, over time, um, again, everything here is is one-to-one -one substituted from the, um, the X, Y nomenclature that we saw in the last lecture. Um, but yeah, very, very straightforward, right? If um, if the XI token is one being introduced to the pool, then the user is losing that balance. And so this will be denoted as X sub U sub I. Um, and the J balance um, of the um, for the for the user is always going to be X sub U sub J. And so we're adding um, delta X. Oh, by the way, I just realized that um, it, there's a bit of a redundancy here. The delta x u j. This would be just as um, just as valid it, without the sub u, because this because uh, delta x sub u sub j is exactly the same number as delta x sub p sub j, but otherwise everything is exactly the same. Okay, so this is what we're going to be uh, looking at today, and hopefully you're beginning to see why um, the the new syntax is going to be so helpful. So let's just go through this because I know that um, some of this notation is not going to be familiar to everyone. And also the um, also that I tend to abuse notation fairly regularly. Um, and so if I'm writing it, you know, in a document, I, I will just provide a description of what I mean by certain things. But um, for the sake of this presentation, I'm just going to tell you what it is that I mean. Um, so in, you know, let's just have a look at the left side first. Um, if you haven't seen this symbol before, this just means for all, right? So all we're talk all we're saying is that there is a set of um, of reserve weights that's defining our liquidity pool, and each one of them um, is a number between zero and one, and that the sum of all of these numbers um, is equal to one. So uh, you know, if we've got ten tokens inside a liquidity pool and we want to weight each one of them equally. Um, then each one would receive a reserve weight of 0 0.1. Um, and, you know, this satisfies both of these conditions because now, um, you know, each one of the reserve weights is a number between 0 and 1, and the sum of all of them is equal to 1. As long as that is uh, maintained, then it's going to be much easier for us to, um, you know, to make sure that we're referring to the same ideas as we progress. One of the things that I did say in the last lecture is that this is not strictly a requirement for expressing swaps. Um, but it is really important when it comes to liquidity provision and removal to avoid, um, you know, giving people unfair advantages or, or disadvantages um, compared to other users in the pool, um, depending on whether or not they came early or late. For um, the reserve invariant component, all we're saying is that um, for all of the token balances um, inside a liquidity pool, it must be a positive number. It can never be zero. 
Um, and this, in a way, I think is self-evident. Um, we we know, I think, uh, just from our familiarity with you know the the, um, the constant product curve, um, that it is asymptotic at the x and y axis, meaning that you can never actually drive a token balance to zero, and certainly. Um, you can't create a liquidity pool with a negative token balance, so you shouldn't be able to create a, a liquidity pool with a negative negative token balance. And while it's possible that there may be, um, you know, AMM designs in the future that allow for negative balances, if you know, for example, if it's supposed to represent a loan or or, or some other value, that's that's okay. Um, but in the context of of the discussion that we're having, just know that um, all of the token balances must be, um, you know, a, a positive real number and cannot be zero. Then um, the expression that we're looking at is just that the the product um, of all of the um, all of the tokens. So for each token inside the liquidity pool, raised to oops raised to its respective um, uh, reserve weighting is equal to some constant. And you saw that we came to this conclusion from um, that last homework question. It was something that I, I just stated in the, uh, the last time that we spoke. So I went back over um, some of the, the things that I said in the, in the last lecture. And I realized that one of the concepts that I think is probably the most important concept um, with respect to what a liquidity pool is, what its value is, how it operates and what the the you know the set of um, of the the liquidity pool smart contract the pool token the oracle price and all of these things what they mean together um, and so I did this by uh, sort of asking off the cuff uh, a question about a pool containing ETH and USDC and you know can you insure it through the price and people could um, but I think it missed something really important so now we're going to be we're going to be exploring that situation. Um, but now in three dimensions instead of two. So this is what this is what I was talking about. When we're talking about a liquidity pool and the, the liquidity pool token that it represents or that represents it, um, we're always referring to a portfolio of some value. Um, and in a way, the um, the as the industry has gravitated towards bonding curves as um, as being the invariant function or the implicit curve of some function um, that denotes the token balances inside the liquidity pool, we've kind of forgotten, or at least it's become a little bit more obscured, that the underlying device is still a rebalancing portfolio. And it, re it rebalances according to a very specific um, intent by the person who created it. So for example, you could say that for a portfolio of three tokens, A, B, and C, we want one quarter of the portfolio to be denoted exclusively in A tokens. And then after that, we could say that we want one eighth of the portfolio to be denoted exclusively in B tokens. And after that, we could say that we want five eighths of the, um, the portfolio value to be denoted in C tokens. Now, if that portfolio, let's say that we know something about that portfolio already, either because we've, you know, we've uh, interrogated it or someone's just told us, it doesn't really matter. Let's just say that the, the portfolio is known to be worth $1,000. The important thing here, the real take home message, I think from, um, from all three of the lectures that we're gonna be discussing is that we're trying to say something about not how many tokens there are, but what they're worth. So if you know the portfolio is worth $1,000, Given that one quarter of the portfolio is always denoted in A tokens, you know that there's exactly $250 worth of A tokens. Now, this could be one A token, it could be 0.1 A tokens, it could be a trillion A tokens, right? It doesn't matter how many there are. All that matters is they represent one quarter of the total portfolio value. For B, right, if we know that there's one eighth of the portfolio is, you know, is, um, is denoted in B and the portfolio is worth 1,000, then there must be $125 worth of B tokens. Again, doesn't tell you how many B tokens, it only tells you what they're worth. And last but not least, the majority of our portfolio is denoted in C tokens. Um, and you know, five over eight times 1000 is, is 625. So to harp on that message and for the, the benefit of, um, of repetition, we are not really interested in how many tokens there are. This is kind of the, the mistake I think that people uh, make the first time they, they come to um, analyze AMMs and, and bonding curves. We're much more interested 
in how they compose the portfolio. Um, and I think that the reason why this is often overlooked is because it's a much more sort of nuanced um, way to examine the system, right? And it's, uh, it, it, in a way, it's inconveniently complicated. Because now you're, you're, you're left wondering, well, how do you even do this, right? How can you come up with a system that no matter what is always uh, representing a certain proportion of the portfolio that it represents in itself? And this is where the Bancor formula came from, right? If we take just the sum of the A tokens that, that there are and raise it to the power of a quarter, we take the sum of the B tokens that there are and raise it to the power of an eighth and take the sum of the C tokens, raise it to the power of five eighths. This will always be some constant value. And this is where those, you know, X1 and R1 is coming from. We're really just decomposing the things that are inside the liquidity pool and, um, and pushing it together into this expression. And this is the thing that causes the portfolio to maintain an adherence to the portfolio weights um, that the user has um, has nominated. And I, maybe that's surprising, right? If you've never thought of um, an AMM as, as having that um, property, then I encourage you again to reconsider the situation that I brought up in the last lecture, which is that, um, you know, I said that uh, Uniswap is, or uh, Uniswap V2 is a 50-50 a weighted, you know, bank or V1 liquidity. Um, and if so, if we've got some ETH in there and some USDC in there, and we know the price of both of them, remember, you even intuitively know that at any time when you withdraw your liquidity from Uniswap, exactly half of its value is going to be denominated in ETH and exactly half of its value is going to be denominated in USDC, or that the total amount of USDC in the liquidity pool is equal in value to the total amount of ETH in the pool. And that that's true no matter what. Right, even if neither one of those tokens um, is being denominated um, in the other. So for example, you could have a, a compound Aave uh, liquidity pool on Uniswap V2. And even then, right, you know that when you withdraw the liquidity from there, the dollar value of the Aave and the dollar value of the compound is going to be equal, even though dollars isn't even a part of the um, isn't even a part of the bonding curve. And that is, I think, the the most interesting or the most surprising uh, result of the entire AMM space. And it was also the seminal part, right? And it's kind of sad um, that I think that that has been forgotten. And so it's my pleasure, I think, to um, to um, to speak to you all and sort of bring um, bring attention back to that property because it's it's absolutely not trivial. Okay, so. Um, that explains uh, what these R's mean and, and sort of why we're listing them the way that we have. So in the, um, you know, in the case of a three token pool, we would have R1, R2, and R3. Um, and we would have, you know, XP1, XP2, and XP3. Um, but that's not limited there. We can go up to any number um, of tokens that we want and whatever we choose R to be, right? That will always be the total uh, value proportion of the portfolio that it represents. So <clears throat> these are kind of the key, um, key formulas um, now re-indexed um, to, um, you know, to get rid of the, the X and Y and, and other things um, and, and instead use our, uh, our large operator um, nomenclature in order to make things a little bit easier. So uh, again, uh, that you can, if you need to categorize these ideas in your head, just remember that you know the you can deal with exclusively the reserve invariant, meaning um, the way that the liquidity is constructed inside the pool. Um, you can have a look at um, the way that the liquidity pool token interacts with the user who is providing or removing liquidity from that pool, or you can also have a look at um, how one token is exchanged for the other token um, and does not involve um, a, a, an LP token intermediate. And all three of these things are absolutely valid ways of examining what I consider to be sort of the, the object of a, of a bonding curve or of an AMM. Um, and neither one of them is, is, I would say, more right than the, than the other. They're all sort of you know, um, e equally helpful 
uh, perspectives on the on the same mathematical concept. And so to sort of focus just on the swaps, um, I think sort of is is to uh, deprive yourself of a much deeper understanding of how these things um, behave. So as we move into n dimensions, as I said before, it becomes much more difficult to um, to visualize things, um, and this is problematic, but it's not um, unachievable. So the you know the two dimensional representation of a, of a winding curve with with, um, with only two tokens is 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 trivial, um, and luckily three dimensions isn't too bad. Um, this is um, what's called a, a cross eye stereogram. And uh, you can try this. It doesn't work for everyone. It's a type of optical illusion. Um, but the idea is that if you allow your eyes to go cross-eyed um, and then focus um, you know, both of these images in the center, it will actually produce a, um, a, a, a 3D image for you that kind of mimics depth um, you know, similar to what AR um, or VR would, would give you. Um, so this is one possible way to do it. Um, you can also, um, you know, draw um, a, a 3D curve, um, you know, in any of these dimensions that, that you have. Um, and maybe this is a better way to do it. Um, and what I find, though, is that people generally don't really have a good grasp on what the shape of these things is until they have a, uh, a, a way to interact with it. And so what I'm going to show you is um, exactly what that looks like here. Can you see this? Can you see my notebook? Yes, very clear, Mark. Thanks for sharing this. This is so exciting. Perfect. <laughs> I love when we go to Jupiter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, so what we've got here is I've created a, a bonding curve with five different assets in it, and I've just labeled them A, B, C, D, and E. And you can see here that I'm asking just to see the A, B, C slice. Um, and so now we've got this, um, this plotly plot um, and you can see that if I get close, um, it has this wonderful uh, property of being able to sort of um, draw these, these contour lines across its surface. And it's important to realize that wherever we are on this plot, um, you can, you know, you can actually get the, um, you know, a, a, a gradient um, from, you know, any, any direction, right? The, what we're really looking at when we've got, you know, more than three assets in a pool is that when there's a, you know, when we're trying to quote a price, you can either quote the price always in one asset versus a different asset in the pool, which I think is very, uh, that's a very, very helpful way to do it. It kind of keeps things, um, you know, nice and, uh, and, and reasonable. Um, but in some higher, um, some higher math, it's also possible to quote um, like the, the direction of, of one token um, with respect to two other tokens. Um, or the opposite, right? What two tokens is worth um, at the same time compared to one token. And you can sort of compose and decompose these things together as you go. Um, but it's important to remember when we're, you know, every time we're, we're looking at, um, you know, one of these um, bonding surfaces, this is still just a three-dimensional slice of a, a hyper object. Um, so you can see here, um, I think, yeah, this is in dimensions uh, A, B, and C. Um, but then we, you know, we get a, it looks the same because it's always scaling it to a cube, but this is now dimensions A, B, and E. Um, and the, the thing to realize, I think, um, that's going to sort of, I, I hope make it a little bit easy, uh, easier to understand is that even though the, the A and B dimensions are exactly the same, the C dimension, um, in the, the top one, um, is, you know, is scaling, um, is going off the scale at, at around 700. Whereas in E, um, it's already going off the scale at half that value. So the um, the rate at which um, you know the, uh, the the gradient changes um, is can be much faster or much slower depending on the reserve weight. Right. The only difference between these two things is um, that the um, the reserve ratio of C is uh, 0.3, whereas the reserve ratio of E is half that. So it's no um, you know, it's no coincidence that the 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 E dimension scale is is half of what the C dimension scale is, which is coming back to something that Octopus asked me about last week, um, which is just the fact that you know, no matter what um, hyperbola you're you're drawing, anything that has this kind of um, you know power sequence um, could always be stretched and and squished in order to give you the same shape again, um, just by rescaling the axes. 
Um, and just to sort of make the point uh, perfectly clear, here is one with dimensions C, D, and A, and it looks like the same shape, um, but you can see that now we've got the C dimension um, on one scale, the D dimension on the other, and now the A dimension um, is, is coming off the, the Z here and ending at 400. Um, so you can, you know, you can gain, I think, a, a better appreciation um, for, for how these things work. I'm also seeing them, um, and I've got to remember how to do this, but there, there is a, a way, I think, in Plotly where you can, rather than force everything into a cube, you can say, um, you know, let everything be on natural scale so that all of the, the ticks, all the tick spacing matches up. Um, and then you can really see that you can get sort of this distorted looking, um, you know, squashed or rescaled hyperbola shape, which is quite nice. Okay. Okay. So recall then um, that we're talking about, um, we're talking about portfolio weights, right? That we are, um, you know, th these, these reserve weight numbers that we're choosing um, are always going to be how, how, how much of the portfolio is denominated in that token, no matter how we measure the portfolio's value. So this $1,000 here, I chose for convenience, but it, this could just as, just, just, has, just as easily have been Bitcoin or ETH or, you know, tomatoes or, you know, secondhand cars. Whatever denomination we choose, we can still split the portfolio this way, even if whatever that thing that we're denominating it in isn't present in the portfolio itself. So um let's think now about market equilibration and rate dynamics in light of um you know some of this new information so i'm going to introduce um this is a this is i, I don't think that this is standard I'm, i just made this up um but i'm going to introduce some um you know some new syntax here so that we can describe the prices of things i think in a uh, a more mathematically concise way or at least a more uh, a, a way that is more um uh, amenable to things like um like dimension analysis um or unit analysis if you if you prefer so let p be the price of something right so for example um you know let, let it be like the oracle price and I've, I've stated here that an oracle you know don't let this infer that an oracle network is needed like you know like chain link or, or something similar just that there is, you know, some knowledge somewhere in the market that the prices of what the prices of these things are in whatever we're trying to denominate them in. Usually, the best oracles are arbitrageurs. So, the way that I'm going to define the price of something is that whatever that um, whatever that token's identity is, right? If this is, you know, uh, you know B and T or, or you know, gearbox or whatever it happens to be, I'm going to let the price be um, denominated such that it's the the uh, the number of that token um, that you get uh, per US dollar, right? So, um, in um, in in this instance, if we if we want to get P ETH and ETH is you know um, is two thousand dollars then the the p value here will have a value of one over two thousand but the units will be eth per usd right um and similarly for for bitcoin if bitcoin is twenty thousand then the this p value is going to be the reciprocal of twenty thousand but the units will be btc per usd um and th again this is just convention um i could have chosen to do it the other way around which would be in general, that I think the um, the way that finance does it, right? So for for it, it, when you're looking at the price of ETH, you generally don't think of um, you know how many US dollars or how many ETH are equivalent to, to you know one US dollar, uh, but you think of it the other way: how many US dollars are equivalent to one ETH. So this inversion is something that I find you know uh, has baffled like a lot of people that come to um, you know come to to AMMs and start developing, but I. I it turns out that this is also true of like Forex desks and things. It's, this is a, a very common mistake. 
Um, and so, you know, if you think that it's sort of overkill or, you know, redundant to, uh, to claim um, or to define exactly what I mean by the price of an asset, um, just know that, you know, flipping these fractions upside down is, um, I think, probably one of the, the, the greatest bottlenecks in, um, in, in DeFi development uh, when it comes to defining the way that smart contracts should work and things like that. Okay, so what this means is that if we know the Oracle price for two different assets, right, I and J, and we know that we want the marginal price to, um, you know, to be equal um, to the ratio of these two prices, and we know that the marginal price formula is equal to this, then it's possible to derive an expression um, that will uh, allow us to calculate the coordinates of any asset in any, any number of dimensions just by knowing those oracles, uh, those oracle prices. So for example, um, PI over PJ might be something like P over PBT, a PBTC. And you can see here why I've chosen um, to, uh, to quote the price the way that I have. So rather than the price of, um, you know, ETH be 2000, letting it be one over 2000 means that it's much more, um, it, it's, it's much easier um, to, uh, to work with these fractions without having to sort of, you know, remember when you're supposed to take the reciprocal of something or, or, or whatever. Um, so here, uh, if it's we're looking at the number of, we're trying to basically calculate how many ETH are there per BTC. And you can see that, you know, just by glancing at these numbers, that the, um, that, you know, we need at least 10 ETH to be equal to one BTC. Whereas if we had quoted these things upside down, we would end up with a, a slightly weirder, um, a slightly weirder number. And over here, these things would be sort of back to front. Um, so quoting them this way means that we can calculate this number very easily. So this is where the, the convention comes from. Um, but this is important, right? That the, if you've got PI and PJ and you've got access to Oracle prices for both of those assets, and it doesn't have to be in dollars, it could be in euros or ETH or Bitcoin or whatever it happens to be. As long as you can organize the, the price quotes this way, you can generate a, um, a marginal price for one token versus the other. And this is where the market dynamics of, of AMM start to get a little bit more interesting. And this is the, um, the formula that allows you to calculate the exact coordinates of any asset inside the liquidity pool using only those Oracle numbers. And this equation, you will not find published anywhere. I'm not sure if this is a deliberately kept secret, um, but I've often spoken to people that are, um, you know, trying to uh, perform arbitrage on, um, you know, the Bank of V1 contracts don't really, you know, they're, they're largely deprecated, um, but Balancer um, is one of the, uh, um, you know, one of the projects that continues to use the Bank formula. Um, and so I, I, I'm often contacted or have to, um, you know, uh, advise um, other projects on how they can effectively arbitrage that system. Um, Cause you know, they might be creating something like an index fund or they might be creating, um, you know, liquidity um, in sort of the bootstrappy way that the 2080 pool versus maybe a couple of other things to kind of keep the, the price stable. Um, and after that set up, they often complain that it, you know, the balance of pools will fall um, out of agreement with the rest of the DeFi ecosystem, right? Things like, you know, Uniswap V2 um, or Uniswap V3. And the reason is that it is very, very easy to derive the arbitrage formulas um, for Uniswap V1 and V2 and V3. Whereas the balancer system where you've got N dimensions, um, you can't swap any one asset without changing the prices of every other asset. And that is what we're going to look at right now. So, Imagine that we create um, a liquidity pool with uh, these five assets, A, B, C, D, and E. Um, and we've got, you know, the reserve balances here. We've got their reserve ratios. Um, and I've just made up some, some Oracle prices. There's nothing special about these numbers. Um, I've got them in red because I've deliberately made sure that these, um, these prices don't match the marginal rates between any of these assets. Um, and if you want to verify that for yourself, um, this is the exchange rate matrix. Um, and the way to read this is always, it's the um, the, the row, um, or sorry, the, the column name over the row name. 
So, um, you know, if you want to know the exchange rate of A per B, exactly the same way that we had it before, then it's always the column, you know, A over B is equal to 0 0.5, meaning the price of A over the price of B is equal to 0 0.5. And remembering that it's the reciprocal um, of the, the price that you would usually consider. So let's just go through a quick example here. If um, if the 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 price of uh, if the price of A over the price of B is equal to 0 0.5, then this means that um, there are twice as many A tokens. Uh, sorry, there, I mean this means that there are twice as many B tokens per numera than there are A tokens per numera. Um, and so, you know, if we're looking at, you know, uh, a stable coin um, that is worth $2 versus a regular stable coin that's worth $1, then um, the, uh, it would be the, the B token would be the, um, would be the $1 one, right? Because it's going to be twice as many A tokens, um, or sorry, twice as many B tokens. Make sure I get that the, around, around the right way. Conventionally, or using traditional arbitrage, uh, traditional uh, financial intuition, we would assume that um, if the price of A over the price of B is equal to 0 0.5, then we would think that that means B is $2 and A is $1, right? But the reverse is true here because we're not quoting it in dollars per A, we're quoting it in A per dollar. Um, so it's actually A is the $2 coin and B would be the $1 coin. Um, and you can see, obviously, because of the way that we're quoting this, it's ones um, down the diagonal because we're always comparing A to A and B to B and so forth. Um, so if you want to know the, you know, the price of A in B or the price of A in C or D or E, then these are all the numbers that we get just by applying that marginal price, um, that marginal price formula. So this is coming directly from um, the expressions that we've um, that we uh, looked at both in the last lecture um, and have um, um, looked at in slightly more detail in this one. So this is the interesting step, right? How do you make sure that all of the um, all of the pool balances, after swapping tokens with other tokens, eventually agree with those oracle prices? Octopus. Uh, um, I don't mean to derail you. Uh, no, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask. Uh, so I, I've seen a lot where people have a matrix of prices and then they run it through. Um, a graph theory algorithm called Bellman Ford to search for arbitrage cycles or profitable arbitrage cycles. Is the convention that you've chosen compatible with that, or do I need to flip it back <laughs> before? Uh, I, uh, yeah, I mean that's a. I'm not super familiar with that um, algorithm, honestly. Um, the you're right there. Uh, so th there are a number of them, um, including things like um, the. Uh, like convex optimization, I think is is one that it depends on whether or not you're doing it between liquidity pools or within a liquidity pool. Um, ah, okay. Right. So between liquidity yeah. pools means that there's you need to take into account the fact that they're going to be different sizes, um, and this can complicate things. And in general, that's where convex optimization um, is your best friend. Um, but actually, our our chief economist has come up with one that's slightly faster and a little bit more numerically stable. Um, that we call the the marginal price method. Uh, we haven't published it yet, um, but we're going through. Like we're not keeping this stuff secret. We'll we'll, we'll let you know when it's out. Um, but the the thing that I'm trying to pay attention to um, with the, these slides is that let's just assume that it's there is only one liquidity pool all by itself, um, and it's got all of these different tokens in it. Um, and it, you know it, it doesn't exist in a vacuum, right? It still exists in the context of of the rest of the market of third party participants. And those third-party participants will act or are incentivized to act in such a way so as to make sure that our portfolio uh, composition is equal to, you know, the or, or its value um, composition is equal to the reserve weights that we that the, the user chose when they created the liquidity pool in the first place. So in in our situation, because it is just the the you know the single liquidity pool, you can just use um, this. Um, this expression um, to calculate the exact coordinates um, of each of the the tokens. There's actually there's there is hardly any need um, for um, you know for anything more. There, there actually there just isn't any need for anything more sophisticated than this because it's deterministic um, from the outset. 
I should point out that um, even what I'm showing you today, even though it is slightly complicated, um, it actually gets more complicated because so far we haven't really considered how fees uh, change the, the price quote for things and what it even means to have a balanced um, liquidity pool um, in the, you know, when there is a cost um, to the user to interacting with it. But this is something that I, I, I was hoping that we would explore um, next time. So long-winded explanation, but the point the, the point is, is that yes, you're right. There are lots of arbitrage um, methods out there and, and algorithms, some better than others, some faster, some more numerically stable and so on. Um, they are, those ones are generally optimized to perform arbitrage between different sources of liquidity when they don't necessarily have the same size. Today, we're only looking at performing arbitrage within the same liquidity pool. Um, which means that we don't need anything too fancy and you can just use the, you know, an algebraic uh, method to solve it. I see, because there's no differing opinions about, or there's a single source of truth about price in this instance. Yeah, exactly. And this is, yeah, this is kind of, um, if we go back a second. Oh, no, wait. We were forward, my mistake. Yeah, this is why the... Um, the choice of the word like Oracle price is not incidental, right? We are literally saying that we we know for a fact um, that this is the the price of uh, of these things in dollars, um, and so we assume that someone is going to you know has access to either an infinite source of liquidity somewhere else, um, or just that there is someone um, in the market who is um, either interested in exiting from a position so long as it they get. A a, um, a price better than the market rate um, or that there's someone who wants to enter into a position um, or is encouraged to enter into a position so long as they're getting a, a, a better than market rate um, trade. Um, and these assumptions have turned out to be pretty good. You know, like uh, I think in the very, very beginning, um, there wasn't even that much, um, you know, traction on, on Ethereum, right? Back in 2017 when Bankcore was released. Um, but within a couple of weeks, you know, there was a, a very large number of um of sophisticated arbitrage bots and things that were, were already um swapping and um and rebalancing the the pool um usually interfacing with uh you know something like binance or um you know back then it was probably bitfinex but whatever the the point that, it, that I'm, I'm trying to make is that the people that interact with the liquidity pool are almost a part of the the liquidity pools system right it is the um the heat <laughs> You know that 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 causes the uh, or or maybe it's the the liquidity pool that is the the heater that like you know loses heat to the to the ecosystem. But whatever, whatever your uh, um, your perspective is, the liquidity pool by itself and all of the equations and things that define it, um, they the only reason they work is because eventually someone is um, selfishly motivated to interact with the liquidity pool so long as um, it's bringing that liquidity pool into balance with you know, the market expectation. Thank you, that's really helpful. My pleasure. Okay, um, so yeah, those are the exchange rates. Then um, this is the, um, the instructions, if you like. Oh, MD, go ahead. <clears throat> Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, great job so far. Um, it, it, before we go on, could I just ask a question regarding um, this topic um, and see if we could um, attach it to like a traditional finance uh, scenario? Mm -hmm. um, you know, so like you've referenced index funds or ETFs and, <clears throat> and you've uh, referenced portfolios, which is really cool because to think of things as a portfolio I think is um, pretty intelligent uh, um, kind of viewpoint or lens to look at this stuff. But if you look at, at a portfolio of stocks uh, held in a basket and um, a user, um, a holder of that basket has like a token that represents the composition. So in your case here, it's a three token model. So the, you know, the LP token represents the composition of these three, correct, Mark? You, you've been sharing that. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. So then, 
so I guess what I'm saying is uh, technically, um, if a request comes in for redemption in an ETF, uh, the structure can choose what to sell to, to fulfill the redemption. Whereas in right. this scenario, the equation is fulfilling that request for redemption automatically. Right. Is that fair to say? Yes, that is absolutely fair to say. Yeah. So in this, in this situation, yeah, in this situation, if, uh, yeah, so you're right. So if, if you've got a, um, you know, a, a, a managed fund that has created the index and you are trying to redeem for like dollars or something like that. Um, it could be, by the way, that part of that um, index includes dollars in it. Um, but you, often it's just composed of different stocks. Now, when uh, when you say that, you know, you want to redeem, it's almost always the case that you, you you want cash, not, you know, some of the stock in that in that portfolio. And so then the fund manager is going to be the one that is tasked with um, determining how the, um, you know, which stocks are going to be the ones that um, that get sold in order for the, this person to withdraw their value. And that's going to be influenced by a whole bunch of different things, right? Including, um, you know, uh, including market liquidity and, and other, um, you know, and other effects. You could actually do this with an AMM. And in fact, there was um, there was someone that I advised recently who, who was doing exactly this structure, where instead of uh, liquidity withdrawals being like um, instantaneous, um, you know, there would be like a holding period and it would be settled at like the, the end of each week. But at the time that you choose to withdraw, um, the, 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 the value of your position is preserved. So if you withdraw today for $1,000 um, by, you know, week's end, that, that will be what you're delivered. And a lot of, um, you know, a, a lot of ETFs actually do have that same sort of holding period. You can't necessarily withdraw very large amounts, um, you know, instantaneously uh, that you have to wait for, for things to clear and that kind of thing. The problem with cryptocurrency is that um, if you are trying to do that as, as a DeFi project, um, depending on where you're regulated, you will very, very quickly um, find that your, your legal um, exposure uh, becomes profound. Um, so even, you know, so I'm more familiar with the, the Swiss regulation, um, but in this particular instance, uh, if, you know, if one of the developers had to decide you know, which tokens are, are going to be sold and, and for what and how long that's going to take and that kind of thing. We would become both a financial services provider and a fi I think a financial intermediary. Um, and we would need to apply for all kinds of, you know, financial licenses in order to offer um, that kind of product. And so this is why, um, you know, th this is why a lot of uh, DeFi protocols are built in such a way that the, um, you know, the, the way that it operates is, is exclusively under the user's choice. And so you're right to observe that, you know, if the, you know, if, if someone's withdrawing exclusively from like token A, then, you know, the, the value of their position is going to slip a little bit. And so they won't quite get, you know, if, if let's say that they owned 50% of this, of this liquidity pool, they wouldn't quite get $125. They would get, you know, some number slightly less than that. But they also have the option, right, to withdraw in A and B or A and B and C and in any ratio. And so in a way, you're taking the, the decision making that the financial professional would make and you're giving those decisions to the user. And in a sense, that is exactly what DeFi was supposed to do, right, is to take all of the, you know, the incumbency, all of the, the middlemen um, that kind of make decisions on your behalf and tell people you can make the decision now. Now, th there's a problem with that, which is that it assumes a some level of financial literacy, which is generally a very bad assumption, especially in, in DeFi for some reason. Um, but that is kind of the ethos, right? It's a, um, you know, it's a, a very libertarian point of view. And with that in mind, you have to remember that the opposite side of that coin is that everyone has a democratic right to fail or, or a democratic right to make a bad decision. Um, whereas traditionally, um, you know, financial regulation is to protect people against bad de bad decisions. DeFi is you have the right to make a bad decision. Oh, thanks a lot, Mark. I, I just see it as a um, just another example of like um, um, how the designs are are 
are kind of morphed from, you know, there's like a certain framework from traditional finance that you can bridge over to DeFi and then, you know, you adjust it for DeFi. And so, right. um, yeah. And, and actually it gives kind of uh, creativity and like even uh, hope in the sense that, that you know, I, I do believe that the, the Lego pieces will and might even already be here to build something like this if you were so adventurous. But as for another day, thank you. You're very welcome. And you're right. Certainly some of those pieces exist. Um, the, the ones that are the most compelling are the ones that um, preserve anonymity of the person who's doing the management. Um, and this is, I mean, it's, it's fine, but it completely flies in the face of like the trustless narrative of, of blockchains and DeFi. Um, because as soon as you are allowing someone that you don't know, um, who, who no one knows, um, you know, the ability to manage funds on, on your behalf, um, the failure rate is going to be extremely high. And, you know, in a way, this is what DeFi has become known for, right? Is strangers trusting their money to other strangers um, and those, you know, trustees uh, essentially taking off into the sunset with it. Um, so I think that the way that, you know, it, it's you're right to observe that the, the pieces are here, but what, what they don't account for is the, um, you know, the ill will of humans towards each other in general, or the greed of, of, of humans, or the, uh, the affinity of, um, of, of humans in DeFi, specifically for, for financial crime. Um, and this is where I'm getting, like, I am actually quite interested in, um, you know, in, in cooperating with regulators and bringing in, like, institutions that have some sort of, uh, that will experience some sort of legal, um, you know, ramification to if they behave badly. Um, and then we can start to develop some of these, um, you know, some of these products that you're talking about. But yeah, the, the challenge has always been, how do you do it without trusting anyone and without anyone having to manage anything um, and giving, you know, the user the full responsibility um, of, of the protocol. Um, and in a way, I think that the best product market fit is to treat that as one extreme and then treat traditional finance as the other extreme. And that DeFi can re represent something that's kind of in the middle. So bringing in, you know, licensed, um, you know, trustworthy institutions to make decisions on users' behalf, I don't think is too much of a compromise. Well, in a weird way, we're seeing this kind of, uh, and I don't want to stop you because I, I want to respect uh, your presentation, but it, uh, these automated liquidity management providers now, Mark, Correct. where you yeah, have yeah. these protocols that are managing, um, people's LPs in the most optimal way because of the new um, Uniswaps like V3, where you can have a narrow or wide band of liquidity and stuff. And sometimes it, your tokens get out of whack because of some market movement, but now there's actually protocols that are just, uh, they're doing that for, for users. Anyways, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. The important thing to realize about even those ones is that um, there's usually some off-chain component there might be like someone can correct me if I'm wrong. It could be a, um, a liquidity management solution that's entirely on chain. Um, in which case, you know, I think that we're already there. It's not just that we've got all the pieces, but they might actually be already assembled and functioning. Um, but of the ones that I'm aware of, um, there's there is always some kind of off-chain component, um, whether it be you know um, the the logic that that performs the rebalance or or something else. Um, so it's not quite um, you know, it's in that sense, it's like, is it even still DeFi? Um, but whatever, it's uh, it, 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 there's clearly a market for it. And so I don't mind if the industry is heading towards that direction. OK, um, where were we? OK, so let me uh, there was a, a bit of a um, a bit of a, a tangent. So let's um, just remind ourselves where we're up to. Um, and this is that, you know, I've, I've told you what I mean when I say um, the price of ETH is one over 2000, right? That means that the price of ETH is $2,000, but I'm going to quote it as ETH per dollar, not dollars per ETH. Um, and if you al allow for that, you know, uh, let, let's say counterintuitive way of quoting a price, then at least you can come up with a very, very nice um, formula 
that um, that allows you to rebalance a pool in any number of dimensions. And so to demonstrate um, that this is possible, um, we're, we're creating a liquidity pool here with just generic tokens, A, B, C, D, and E. Um, we've given them some reserve balance here. We've given it some reserve ratio. And we have um, quoted the Oracle prices here, um, largely at random. So uh, you know, none of these Oracle prices, I think, really line up with, um, with any of the exchange, rate, exchange rates that you would expect between any of these tokens. Um, and this is the exchange rate matrix to show you um, exactly what those exchange rates are, exchange rates are. And so as you go through the um, the Oracle prices, um, you may find that some of them agree um, and some of them don't. Um, but the point is, is that this pool is, is out of balance and we want to calculate exactly what the swaps should be um, in order to um, in order to re to rebalance it. And so now we're kind of stepping out of the protocol um, uh, out of the, the the protocol side of things and now into the shoes of someone who is interacting with the protocol as a trader for the explicit purpose of um of you know of, of selfishly trading against the liquidity pool in order to to turn themselves a, a profit right um and as they do that it should bring the um the the balance of all of the tokens um into such a state that the portfolio valuation um, is deconstructed in exactly uh, or exactly according to the reserve weights. So this is that instruction set. Um, we start by swapping 3.7-ish um, of the uh, E token for 16 of the A token. We then swap 2.8-ish of the D token for 5.07 B tokens. We then swap uh, 2.5 C tokens for 3.19 B tokens. And then these two B tokens that we've accumulated, um, we, we keep some of that um, and we swap the rest um, for 1.7 of, um, of the A token. And after we've done that, you'll see that these are the new uh, reserve balances. Um, so quite away from uh, from where we started, the reserve ratios are, have, have obviously not changed, um, and the um, the oracle prices now perfectly agree um, with um, with the state of this liquidity pool. And so the exchange rate table now looks um, quite different, um, but that's good, right? We 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 expected that. Okay. Um, yeah, we're up uh, about 75 minutes. Um, so th this is roughly where I wanted to um, to end things. Um, but I have um, you know a little bit of homework before um, we begin the um, begin the, the next lecture next week. And that is to assume that um, after having completed this arbitrage step, um, you know exactly the way that that we just did. Uh, assume then that the Oracle then uh, quotes all of these tokens as being exactly $1. What are the steps um, that you would need to take in order to rebalance that pool? And this is, I think it's it's at least slightly more involved, um, but there's nothing that you have to, I think, deduce here. This is mostly about applying uh, some of the theory that I've already, um, that I've already um, provided here. Um, and then there's a couple of other things that you might want to do while you're there. For example, after you've rebalanced the pool and everything is at $1, can you confirm for yourself that, um, you know, however many A tokens there are, um, multiplied by $1, is that equal to, you know, exactly 20% of the overall portfolio um, value itself? Um, and, you know, confirm, um, you know, confirm everything that I've, um, that I've stated along the way. But yeah, so I did have um, much greater ambitions for, for this lecture. I wanted to show you um, what, um, what concentrated uh, liquidity looks like. Um, so uh, I think I'll save that for, for the next lecture, which might mean that either we bump um, some of the stable swap um, curves, which is something I don't want to do because I think that this group will, um, will find that sort of material to be pretty interesting. Um, so either I'll try uh, I'll try and see if I can compose this all together into sort of one coherent story, but more likely um, I'll probably just ask uh, Curious if he'll uh, allow me to uh, to add one more lecture to the um, to the set, um, and I'll try and keep it um, 
I'll try and keep that one relatively short. But yeah, so this is, uh, that concludes uh, the talk for today. So you now basically know um, everything uh, there is to know, I think, about um, Bancor V1, um, which includes everything that Balancer does. Um, and so, and, you know, in a way that also includes everything that uh, Uniswap V1 does, everything that Uniswap V2 does, and everything that, you know, the original Trader Joe does, everything that SushiSwap does. Like, this is a, a fairly comprehensive, um, you know, summary of, um, of like, where AMMs and bonding curves and liquidity pools got started. The notable exceptions are, um, obviously, uh, Uniswap V3, which is an extension of Bancor V2, and I'll show you that um, in the next lecture. Uh, Dodo um, is completely unique, um, and Curve is also completely unique. Um, there are some examples of some other like exotic bonding curves around, such as like you know the Solidity, uh, sorry the the Solidly um, uh, stable swap bonding curve and other things. Um, but we'll we'll examine these along the way. The point is is that by the end of this lecture, you've now been sort of introduced to um, the theory that describes you know something like ninety percent of um, you know uh, of all AMMs um, on Ethereum today. So thank you for your attention, and um, I'm happy to answer any more questions if there are any. I have a question. I, I thought about DMing it to you, but I think I'll err on the side of transparency. Sure. Um, but so for the property, so I I don't I wish I could remember the source. I've seen papers that try to define constant function market maker in a very mathematical way. One of the properties, and there are different properties they propose, like homogeneous, homothetic, blah blah blah. Um, but it struck me that when you were talking about you could rescale it. That I think that that's the geometric interpretation those definitions are trying to get to. Um, do you, do you have a a geometric way in which you think about this that you know being able to rescale it or I don't have a very coherent question, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the the weights, um, yeah. There there is a there is a um, there is a very, very helpful geometric in intuition. And there's actually, there's a YouTuber um, called Mythologer, who is a, um, a uh, I think he's a professor of mathematics at Monash University, actually not far from where I live. And he had, um, he had a video recently that was looking at like uh, essentially the, the, the property of a, um, the property of a hyperbola right? Or this very specific property of a hyperbola, um, which is like, it's the only shape that um, no matter how you stretch it, you can always like compress it in the other direction and it will like equal itself. Um, and so in that sense, this rescaling is like, it's almost like, um, like wrapping a token. So for example, imagine that we had, um, you know, imagine that the, the price of Bitcoin was like relatively stable at 20k um and the price of uh, ethereum was relatively stable at 2k we could um you know and then imagine that you know we we wanted to create a a, a way to to make markets with these things but for some reason our ocd um you know required us to provide you know the same number of of bitcoin and you know the other asset um at the same time to the liquidity pool so under this like obviously ridiculous situation right no one cares how many you know tokens you provide to the pool in the first instance but you could imagine a case where someone insists that um not only do the values have to be the same but the actual number of tokens that you're providing also have to be the same okay what could we do? We could create like a wrapping contract where you take 10 ETH and wrap them together and it issues exactly one like 10X ETH. And so that means that one 10X ETH in our case is equal to one BTC, right? They're going to, they're now both worth $20,000 each. Um, and then we create our liquidity pool that way. We could also, like the, in a way, this is the, the like one of the heuristics that you can apply to help understand like how the reserve weights are functioning. 
Um, because what you could also do is just say that the um, you know the 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 scale of um, of um, of the, the the Bitcoin component is um, is one tenth that of the ETH component, um, and so we can actually skip the um, skip the wrapping contract altogether and just change the weight of um, of the of Bitcoin to be what zero point nine zero nine zero nine and the um the weight of um of eth to be one minus that um, and then we would also be providing an equal number of um of btc and eth but their exchange rate would still be um you know the the bitcoin is 10 times more expensive than eth so that's a, a, i'm not sure if i'm really sort of explaining it very well but that's the geometric sort of intuition that i want you to have you you really are just like compressing the hyperbola on one side and stretching it on the other side, such that the number of tokens that you can add to the pool is arbitrary, but it gives you the same control over the exchange rate, so that when you create the pool, um, there are no arbitrage, um, you know, instances available. Well, I like maybe that idea. I, so. okay. Could, could you uh, either spell or say slowly the name of the channel on YouTube again? I'll send it to you. It's Mathologer. So M-A-M-A-T-H-O-L-O-G-E-R. I'll find the exact video. I, I saw it um, maybe two or three weeks ago. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll find it. I'll send it to you on Telegram. I will editorialize briefly and say I like that idea. I like that. In, I like that idea so much more than the intuition I had before, which was that this came from solving a differential equation for spot price. I like your interpretation so much better. Thank you. I'm glad. Like, I, I hope that it's not that you, that you just like it better, but that in a way it's more useful. You know, like it kind of gives you a, um, you know, it's almost like when you find a new shortcut key or something on Windows that you didn't know was, was there before, and now. You know the operating system is just that much more powerful. I feel like you know the way of thinking about these things as portfolios rather than just you know price quoting machines. You realize that there's actually a lot of sophistication to this thing. Like it's a very it's a, a very like short, complicated, but also very very powerful machine. Um, and you know the the math that we're looking at here is you know again like it, it intimidates some people. But remember, you can decompose it down to just these three equations, right? This is all you need to describe everything that we've looked at over the last two lectures, um, which I, again, I think it's a, a beautifully reductionist uh, way of, uh, of examining uh, what is absolutely a very complicated system. Cool, all right. Um, well, uh, we're coming up on an hour and a half. Uh, I know that um, for many of you, it's very late. So I'm happy to end the lecture here unless there's any more questions. Thank you, Mark. I want to thank you for your time. Uh, Rabbit messaged me. He's in India. It's quite late. He said he might uh, doze off. <laughs> He's probably yeah. dreaming of uh, of uh, bonding curves right now. So I want to thank you for your time. And this was incredible. I really appreciate um, this presentation and so looking forward to the next one. And if we do a part four, that's even more exciting. So. Okay. Wanna... Well, I'll see you guys thank next you. week. Thank you. Thanks, everyone for joining. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Mark. Fascinating Thanks, stuff. Mark.